Hi, my name is Benedict. This is going to be the uh, fifth and final instalment in the series on, uh, on creating sounds to use in your arrangement. I often use the word mix. Uh, mix is a popular word uh, and probably I should say mix, 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 because mix is so fashionable. Uh, but really, it is an arrangement. You only mix it once you've got a good arrangement. I know there's a great tendency, rant alert here, uh, there's a great tendency to get into mixing before you've got an arrangement, but what are you mixing? Nothing, which means that your mix has no purpose. It's kind of like walking randomly from your house, hoping you're going to encounter food. Is it the best way of doing it? Or would you perhaps say, why am I leaving the house to get food? Because I is hungry. I'll Google places that might be able to provide me with food based upon resources in my wally, and I would then set out appropriately. If it's like two minutes walk down the road, then I probably will walk. If it's going to be an eight hour walk, might want to drive, take a helicopter, call Uber, any of those sorts of things. So let's put aside the idea of mixing even though this is going to be about mixing. Let's put aside the idea of mixing until we've got a sense of arrangement and an arrangement comes from a sense of purpose. So if we're going to the shop to get ourselves some food, the reason is because we is hungry, the arrangement in that situation is where we're going and how we're going to get there. So if we need to take a car, a car defines part of the arrangement. You know, we've got to put on pants and maybe some shoes and, if we need them, some goggles so that we don't run straight into the first tree that leaps into our way. So, this is going to be very relevant to this episode, so I'm not actually sidetracking, even though I appear to be. This episode is about how to create layered sounds. This actually comes from Travis. It was a question from Travis who's somebody I've known online for, I don't know, 10 or so years or whatever. He's often asked me questions, and I'll be real honest, often when he first asks them, I think, Travis, you're an idiot. Sucks to be you. But then, like a couple of minutes later, I think, you know what, Travis, that's actually a really good question. And it's one that I see a lot of people struggle with. Therefore, it was actually an extremely good question. Phew, goes Travis. So what we're looking at in this episode is to round out the first things that we've looked at where we've broken up sounds into different types of categories, so bases, polyphonic sounds, leads, and pads, they, they, that basically covers everything you need. I know most of you are screaming drums, and maybe I'll make a drums one some other time. I have written articles on how to make drums and what have you, but the reality is I don't think any of you are particularly interested in my take on drums. If I'm wrong on that, please tell me, and I'll be delighted to do a how to make drums based on the Benedict method. So this time we're looking at what are probably more pad sounds, but really can be any kind of sound. But here I'm going to be applying it more to pads, but what you learn here will apply to anything is how do we learn to mix and put all, to get all the right elements into a layered sound? So the first thing we need to do is say, what's the purpose of this sound? What has it got to do? Why does it exist? The second thing we've got to do is look at each of the elements of that sound and work out how to get them to play nice so that we end up with a beautiful sound. And it doesn't have to be pretty beautiful. It can be bloody ugly beautiful if you want, if that's the purpose that you're looking for. If you want to make a sound that sounds like a skinny puppy record, good on you, go for it. Just understand where the beauty lies. The beauty lies in an elegant plan with an elegant solution. And that's what people see and respond to. They may not think of it so logically, but it's a beautiful plan with a beautiful execution. That is what they respond to. So it has to have both halves. You could execute as beautifully as you liked, but it would be pointless. I see and hear far too much of that online, pointless music, and people going, oh, but how can I get exposure? How can I get people liking my tune? Well, to start with, you ain't got no tune. You've got something that you mixed with no purpose. So there's no elegance on either side, no matter how much you side change that mix. 
there is no way that it's going to be elegant because it has no purpose. So let's get into this. We're looking at how to layer sands. You don't need to layer sands. I will be honest and say I tend not to do a lot of layering in my patches. It comes, but I tend not to be layering at the patch level. I tend to be layering at the arrangement level. Now this also is very relevant because the thinking that you apply to how to make an arrangement, I've got my, trying to make my fingers match up. <laughs> uh, when trying to make an arrangement, You've got your melodies, your counter melodies, your variations, your pad lines in the middle, which are generally your chords, and then you've got your bass lines sitting underneath that. All of those things have to work together. If you took all 48 players in a, in a standard orchestra and said, have at it, guys, it would sound less appealing than that tune-up stage they do before the guy comes in and goes tap, tap, tap. It would just be a bloody awful noise. While a few of you might think that was super cool, it would be a bloody awful pointless noise. So that's probably not what you're looking to achieve. So when creating an arrangement, which is going to turn into a mix, into a piece of music, that you mastered, can't forget mastering, you should be thinking, what's the purpose of this? What, what are we saying here? So when creating a, a layered sound, so one patch that's made out of many parts, then we're looking to say, okay, what do we need to put in here? Let's start to look at some things. Here's one I prepared earlier. Oops, let me just fix my monitoring situation. Now I'll hear it in my headphones. Real classic kind of pad. Here's another one. Basically, when making a pad, you're doing one of two things. You're looking to create movement and extra texture through things happening, which is what this second sound does. Things happen. That's those little sounds. You'll not uncommonly hear that as a sequence dropped into a patch. So the patch starts out with a whir, and then it goes whilst the main pad is playing. That is a is a layered sound based on what you could think of as a physical movement. You've got things physically moving around inside that sound. Like that guy has those little worms. This guy is the other type. And this is where layering really started to take off. And it's perhaps a little bit more directly related in some ways to the idea of an arrangement where you're layering your melodies and counter melodies and particularly saying, okay, well, in this instance, I want violins one and violins two both playing this piece because I'm going to end up with a bigger sound because I got more violins. A unison them. So this kind is about taking three different frequency contents, putting them together to create a synergy of those three frequency contents. As hopefully you know by now, when you put any two or more sets of frequencies together, they interact. Some of them build upon each other, some of them cancel each other out. Therefore, by putting two similar together, they've got anything that crosses over, you actually end up with a third thing. You don't just end up with the two glued together, you end up with a third thing, which is the equivalent of bussing on a mixer. So you say, I've got my drums and my bass, I send them to a rhythm bus, and then I process the rhythm bus because you're turning it into one third thing. That bus is no longer a drum and a bass. It's a rhythm bus. 
when we're creating a layered sound, we're actually creating a bus. We've got that set of frequencies and any movements that are involved in them. We add that one. Hear how it really adds an awful lot more. And the third one. And here's a common trick, we'll go over this a bit more later, is that this sound is not majoring in being in tune. Therefore, there is a lot of inharmonic stuff in that sound. Noise, out of tune shit, Benedict, noise. That's the core of that sound. We've made it so out of tune with itself that it begins to have elements of noise while still having some similar elements to what we've got in here. So layering is at heart creating an arrangement within one sound. And we create that arrangement by comparing and contrasting. This one does more comparing. Definitely in the first two parts. These two parts are similar to one another. Yep. When I get the button, similar. So we compare these two together. This one is actually both compare and contrast. Because it's got similar elements, but it's also got some dissimilar elements. The dissimilar in this case is the fact that it's so bloody out of tune. The noise only wouldn't it be a particularly appealing sound. But because we've got these two that are more in tune than not, and this guy which has some in tune but some not, it takes the compare and pulls it together. It takes the contrast and that becomes a feature. So we get the real feel of the throat in that choir through actually having an out of tune sound. Compare and contrast. So basically what you're doing is piling up things that are either similar or dissimilar. And it's working out how to balance the similar and dissimilar to end up with something that is not those three things glued together but it's a whole other device, a whole other thing on its own. Because we're musicians, it's a whole other instrument on its own. It's a whole other storytelling unit. Let's slay this fella now. We're done with him. This one. One I made earlier in one of my commercial refills. This is actually still made up of the same essential instrument, but we've got a player. doing some cool stuff. Let's break this fella apart. So we've got this guy who is moving both in notes, which is what the player is doing, but it's also moving in frequency. See how this is moving around all the time. Things that move dramatically, we will call physical movements. Things that move a bit, but are still essentially the same, we'll call them a frequency movement. So here, that looks like a physical movement to me because it's pretty dramatic. This is probably more of a frequency movement. That definitely is. You can see it's just around. That's just the frequency. So it's it just adds that extra little bit of liveliness. Like we can tell the difference between, again, be quite direct. We can tell the difference between a dead person and a sleeping person because even though they're both still, one of them is animated. Okay. We've got that. We've got this. Again, we can see some elements of physical move and some elements of frequency move. So we're combining techniques here, which is very, very common. Most complex pads combine the two ideas. 
But so long as you've got the sense of there's this idea where we just combine frequencies and this one where we create physical movement, then you can make it easier. Third part. That's just a noise. Put them together. Got a really complex sound. So if we look at it this way, this sand here, this part of it, that's probably the most musical part of it. It's got some physical movement, but it's got the strongest texture. We've added this, which complements, and then this, the sparkly worms. The sparkly worms are what really set that off. So the sparkly worms in this case are the contrast to our similar. So even though we've got two similar which contain elements of physical move and frequency, it's the third which plays far more as physical moves, the sparkly worms. So that creates us quite a complex sound. Now, how do I think this all came to be? History lessons, I, I know a lot of people are kind of like, well, I care about that. Because in, it helps you to understand why people started doing these things. Uh, back in the good old 1980s, uh, we started out with synths being relatively hard to come by. Uh, and if you were going to layer anything, uh, you had to do it all by hand. So back in the 60s, when Wendy Carlos was making Switched on Bach, if she wanted to play a chord, she actually had to beep, beep, beep and record it, and then she had to go in four semitones up and go beep, 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 and then she had to rewind that tape, go seven semitones up from her first notes and go beep, beep, beep. That's commitment. So to create a chord, which is actually a layered sound, three sounds, as opposed to one sound, Even by the early 80s, you still, to create a loud sound made of many things, you had to do it over and over again. Suddenly we got MIDI, Musical Interface, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which allowed you to press play on one keyboard, and you could have 16 other keyboards in your room, all playing exactly the same note at the same time. So it, it took a little while, but people suddenly started to realise Oh, I don't just have to use this sound. I can be using that sound and that sound at the same time. And then that started to really take off as the sounds became more and more complex, more and more huge in the mix. And of course that was fashionable because it was a new arena. We'd not heard those kinds of sounds before. And we still like it. Let's look at one of the simplest kinds of layering. This is, this is 101 for layering. I think you probably worked out right now why I called it Biggest Analogus. It sounds like a mofo over an analog synth. Let's break it down. Let's kill off its effects, the internal effects, the external effects. Effects are actually part of the layering of the sound, and we'll come back to that in a mo. Kind of disappointing after where we started. It's actually a nice sound. But in terms of that huge sound, not so exciting. What have we got here? We've got an analog sawtooth there. We've got another analog sawtooth there. Hmm. So we've duplicated. Except we've detuned it. That's the first form of layering. That's the same. There's no major contrast in this. But we're creating frequency difference by t-tuning it. And then we do the same again. Except 
that was down an octave. That's an octave four, this is an octave three. Because people love that big underneath the sound. You can never go too far wrong with that. So we've created a three layer sound, even though it's really the same sound. But what we've played there is with commonality of frequency. So it's a simple layer that most beginning synthesis will have worked at. Turn on an oscillator, turn on the second oscillator, detune the mothers. Current day, we tend to be even lazier than that. We turn on an oscillator, turn on the unison. And it actually doesn't have the same sound as turning on another oscillator and detuning it. I don't know all the science behind it, because obviously different people will do different unison methods, but they don't sound the same somehow. Use whichever works best for you in the situation. So those three. Now the next layer that we've added here is of itself. So a chorus is made by taking the signal, playing it, taking the signal delaying it and moving that delay time so that it choruses, it gets in and out of tune, it goes and by putting the two together we've now created another layer. That really starts to get, you know, because we've got a lot of frequencies there all working off each other and because they're all out of tune and moving those frequency builds and cancellations are constantly moving which means that they sound huge. A great way to seem large is often to be moving. We can then add another layer. And this layer is also in the effect domain. We've added a delay. So just like the chorus, we've said, we'll let you hear the original sound, but we're going to take a copy of it and play it back a little bit later. So that's even more frequency interactions, additions, cancellations, movement. This delay is also modulated, which means that it moves around like a chorus does as well. So we've got three of these oscillators detuned from each other, a chorus which is detuning them even more and duplicating them, and a delay which is duplicating and detuning them even more. So the amount of movement inside this patch before we've gotten out of our box, is immense. So it sounds big. This device here is really just wave shaping. It's adding a little bit of a little bit of distortion, so it's adding a little bit of non-linear stuff, so more mess basically, and then taming it with a filter, which is really just EQing it. So by rolling off some of the high frequencies we make it feel bigger in the belly, because that's the, the effect we want. And then on to another duplication, which is a delay, with a reasonable amount of feedback. So each time that that echoes, 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 is actually another duplication of that sound. It also carries it right through time. And because it takes so long to slow down, it's like the difference between a tricycle and an 18-wheeler. A tricycle will stop quite quickly because it's small. An 18-wheeler is going to take a lot longer. This sounds bigger. Still going. So size has a big impact as well. So number one thing to look for when you start making um, layered sounds is start with the idea of how do I make this one sound physically bigger. But remember, before you do that, don't just go, I'm going to make it huge so I've got this immense, enormous sound. I've made this immense, enormous sound. I don't recall ever using it. Doesn't mean it's not a damned impressive sound and wherever I hear it, I go, oh. But before I use it, I'm going to need to have a purpose for it. I might, if I was really impressed with that sound as I was, you know, tootling around and go, Ooh. I might then say, I'm going to find me a use for that. I might go. I've taken.
taken into account the character of that sound and decided to compose based upon it. Don't just say, here I've got a mofo of a sound and I'm just going to jam it wherever, because it won't work. Your arrangement's wrong, because you've got the wrong instruments, and of course your mix will be a nightmare, because you're working from the wrong place. So let's get rid of this fella now. So we've looked through, basically, what we're looking for. We're looking to interact frequencies to build positively and negatively with how they interact to create movement. We're also looking to create, at times, a plain physical movement in the middle of our sound. So let me build a patch. I have no idea where I'm going with this. So it probably will be dull. I will probably backtrack. But you're actually going to watch me make a sound apart from my talking, that is. So we'll start that. I've taken three subtractors. Some people will say they're the, the most boring sounding synth ever, ever built. Uh, you're an idiot. They're an amazing synth. I'm just going to turn basically everything off. So there's no movement on any of these. So it's just your stock sound and they're all... That's it. That's just our first fellow up here working. This is what a lot of people do. I've been sent several mixes where I've been really surprised, but the person has actually taken a sound, like that sound. Actually, we'll do this the other way around. They were working with that sound. They've gone, oh, but I want it to be bigger. And they've actually done this. Now, uh, I will admit that does sound bigger. There's two reasons. One is that it is louder. Don't fool yourself with louder. Louder always seems bigger, but it's not any different. It's just louder. If it's starting to distort because it's louder, yes, it is different. You're wave shaping it. But if that's in a problem that's not going to work when you actually get it into your mix because of the rest of your mix is like, Wah! then it's no use. It can be as loud as you like but it's not going to work in a mix. So understand doubling with no movement is probably not gaining anything. But I'll also acknowledge it sounds different because we've changed our frequency component. So that's back to what I was talking about before. By layering this, you've created a kind of a flange. Let me show you. Don't think that by taking your instrument or your musical line, your guitar line or whatever, photocopying it off into another track and playing the two beside each other has really actually changed anything. If you like the sound, fine, but I would suggest putting them back into a bus so you've now got a new sound and process that bus in some way. Because if you just do that, you've not got the same sound as what you had before. And you may not actually be building, because remember, a flanger actually creates that distinctive sound through removing. Essentially, what you've got is a comb filter ripping its way through your sound and gutting it, which is partly why it sounds like an evolving gutted sound. If that's what you're looking for, by all means, go for it. Duplicate your guitar line, your drum line, all your vocals, every single one, and detune them by, f by a, a few cents and what have you, and listen to your whole mix go, Wah! that's what you're after. But simply doubling it is not the wisest thing to do because you're not creating something new in the way you thought you were. If you want it to be louder, process it. Now, what you can, of course, do is let's say I've got my sound. I'm going to mute that, so we're just working on the top one. We'll close these down for the moment so we don't feel like they're in our way. What kind of sound do I want to make? I love strings. Not as much as I love brass. But I love strings. Thank you. 
be cautious about merely detuning everything in one way and not the other. There's nothing wrong with it. But you're pulling that whole patch sharp. So if I wanted to have a difference of, let's say, 25 cents here, that's a quarter of a semitone. That's kind of pulled my patch maybe an eighth of a semitone sharp. You might notice that in your guitar. This is not as noticeable because we've got that one, which is either in tune. But nonetheless, you're still pulling sharp. So there's no reason you shouldn't do it, but you can balance its sharpness and flatness by taking your other oscillator, like taking a total amount of detune that you want and then shifting it a little bit so rather than all going on top you can put some below as well there's a reason however i generally would not do this it's out of tune we're very sensitive to things being flat but nowhere near as much to things being sharp. So, if you're going to do the sharing, do most of the sharing high, and then a little bit of the sharing low. There are reasons and times where you might say, okay, I'm going to add a second line and it's actually gonna be flat, but it's kind of like switching into a minor key. If you're trying to sing a cheery song, in a minor key, it may not be what you hoped for. So, if you decide to sub oscillator one of these, hear how that's starting to sound very much like a Cure record. It's starting to sound down and dumpy great if that's what you're trying to achieve but the ear and the brain is aware of it and you're Bleh. so if you're trying to write your your happy club anthem for people to throw shapes over and you've detuned flat especially on your sub oscillator which becomes the root frequency of your sound then or the fundamental then you've actually tuned your whole sound flat uh, great if you want to write goth rock just great. Everybody's going to be really bummed out in a minute or so. But otherwise, if you want to detune this kind of sound, go high. You've still got a, a brighter, lifted feeling. So the, the human brain is quite happy to accept going sharp but not so much on going flat. Nice. And add a little bit of movement. So we're just adding an LFO for vibrato. If we had more LFOs to spare in this fella, we might look at having one LFO of one speed for oscillator one and a different LFO of a different speed, or even speed and shape, for oscillator two. So that way their movements are more... But we don't have them to spare and it really doesn't matter because we're going to have enough by the time we're done with this. We can add a little bit of, little bit of noise. We'll keep that as bright as possible because we want that to affect in the top. If we do that's okay if we're looking to make that spaceship noise. But 
but I'm not looking to make the spaceship noise, so we'll keep it white. We'll keep it minimal. It's adding just an because that sound, that noise is just oscillators doing this. I have a tune all over the place. Then that little bit of noise is interacting with these existing frequencies and just making this in the middle of the sound. You don't hear it. You don't really want to hear it unless we're adding an obvious noise element. But you'll find that your sounds have a habit of picking up a little bit because it's like you add another LFO to them. Sneaky. This is going to be the middle of our, our pad. If I knew I wanted it to be brighter, I might brighten it up here. We can definitely hear some of the noise, at least I can in my headphones. Okay, the other thing I might do in terms of movement is something that's quite unique in, um, in Subtractor is that you can take all of these wave shapes from being a static wave shape to actually having a phase cancellation of itself. There are two different kinds of maths, um, which I'm not going to try and explain to you, but they're there and they're actually super cool when you accept that they're going to make a different kind of a sound. So we'll add phase here. This is automatically set up to do it the other way around, but I like how this LFO has the ability to keyboard track. So in other words, it changes speed based upon which end of the keyboard you're on, which means that if I'm playing a massive chord up here and down there, or even just a, a chord in the middle, each of those notes, each of those voices in here, is actually LFOing at a different speed. Big. Also, it allows for a little bit of delay. So it means that it doesn't start its LFOing until a bit after the sound has started. Which, again, is a movement. That's a physical movement. So you start out like this. There's that physical movement in there. It's not going to be quite as dramatic here, um, hopefully. Uh, a little less tongue waggling, but by having that movement, your brain notices it. Exciting. So we use this one here to, to, to handle phase. The reason they had the, the keyboard function here is simply because when you're doing phase shifting on an oscillator, it's more noticeable in the low keys than it is in the high keys. So you, if you're using an, an LFO that doesn't change pitch based on keyboard, then you may find you have to back it off a bit. But I'm not looking to get a definitive PWM sound. I'm just looking to move things around a little bit. It does that. So there's my basic pad. Now what do I want to do on top of it? I think I want it to go ting. Because we will find that that is quite slow in our mix. So if we compare that to, say, our kick drum, um, if I were the 909, because it always has to be that, because that's the rules. God, I hate that. And then you'll find that your 909 hits here, boof, and then your pad, you start to hear it here. It's late every time. It's like a drunk. Your options are you can grab all that pad's notes and drag them before the beat. So you might drag them a sixteenth or an eighth or something before the beat because that takes a while. But let's just kill that again. That takes a while to really get itself going. So you might just say, well, drag that forward. Perfect legitimate technique. I don't use it that often. Sometimes on string sounds where they're, where they're a slower sound and they're playing a melodic line, like a lead line, I'll sometimes do that to pull them into time. But I'm quite happy. But my music tends to be, as space music, a lot more relaxed. So my drums aren't about pounding you into oblivion. They're really timekeepers. Stab said that to me about my drums. He said, Benedict, these are really here to mark time, to roll things along. And he was right. Thanks, Stav. So, 
we can have another technique. Hear what happens there? It's made that pad now instant. We can do a couple of things here. The obvious one would be to So we could actually add a bass sound on top of that. Now bass sounds can afford to be somewhat out of tune. So don't be afraid of doing this because what we're doing is we, we've got our pad which is holding our tune, our tuning of our sound reasonably well. And if we add in a bass sound that moves around a little more in tuning, it means that we're playing with frequency. Thank you. That's probably a bit too much now. So that's one thing we can do. Before you just do that, look at your arrangement. Has my arrangement already got a bass in there? In which case you've got two bass players at once. It's hard enough living with one of those guys, let alone two. You could end up with a very bass heavy mix or they just fight with each other especially if they're not playing the same notes at the same time because this is a bass sound even if we're playing our pad up here hear how we're starting to have some hassles even just within that sound because it's but if you've got a bass line and you're playing this Let's say we're playing middle C, our bass line's actually on C below. That's definitely bass territory. So if your bass line happens to be on, let's say, B, not so comfortable. So just be cautious about automatically taking the give it bigger balls approach and adding in, adding in a sub to the sound, because you could just be cutting off your nose to spite your face. Uh, look at your arrangement as to what you want to do. So there's one possibility of what we could do. We could keep it on the same tuning. This puts us into the arena of piano and strings. Probably one of the first really classic layered sounds that suddenly the pianoist in the duo, the jazz duo or whatever, he had the ability to not just be playing the piano, he had the ability to load in the strings at the same time. He didn't even have to have a second keyboard. He didn't need two keyboard players, one to cover the piano, one to cover the stringer. You could actually have the pianos and strings in the one keyboard. It did get overdone. It really did. But it was this. Which is very loud. And boy, was it lovely. So that's another thing that we can do with pads, but it ain't what I'm building here because I'm not in the mood for that. So let's go back up again. Uh, on the same frequency, the same tuning, or we can go. Ooh, that tuning is becoming a problem. You see how it was perfectly acceptable when it was lower? Now it's becoming very unpleasant.
So we're now chasing a bellish sound. We don't necessarily want it that loud. It's hard to tell because of these headphones. It makes everything loud. There is something a little inharmonic in there, as in add tune. I'm not saying it's bad, I'd just like to know where it is. See what I've done there? Take a noise. Just take our noise bit. It's a nice feature of Subtractor, and part of why I really like it for leads. You've actually got a decay envelope on the noise source. Yes, I'm aware, Subtractor is prone to aliasing like a bastard. I don't care, it's part of the sound. If you decide you can't live with aliasing, then don't use digital synths. Matter of fact, throw away your access virus as well, because that alias is like a bastard too. But the fact that it alias is like a bastard is part of why it sounds so really good. So yes, I'm fully aware of this aliasing noise coming back in here, Nyquist stuff. I'm working at 1644, because that is what's being rendered at. I don't waste my time working at 2496 because I'm just not enough of a girl about that. I have done it. I even put an album up onto Bandcamp in 2496 thinking maybe seeing people were, were being so pedantic about it. It's like, oh, maybe they'll buy my music now. There's a 2496 of perfect quality. Did I make any more sales? No, I actually made less. So, if it aliases a bit, there's nothing wrong with it. Just experimenting with other possible things that we might want our sound to do. Ooh. We're looking for character. So this sound, so far we've been mostly working on the same. Now I'm looking for contrast. That first part of our pad is big and fat and meaty. Middle of the road, middle of my head. Now I'm looking for something that contrasts with it, where the pad itself is at the moment in that low range and big gun. I'm now looking to put something else around it, which is a contrast to it. It's the complete opposite of it, which is high and tingy and tingy. So I'm looking to give this a similar detail. We worked quite some time, and you might have thought, geez, Benedict, this is totally rather boring. But I still would have worked similar to that amount of time, despite my talking, uh, even just on that pad part of the sound, because if each part of this sound is pretty impressive, when you put the two, three together, we're going to end up with really impressive. If we put three lame sounds together, yes, they will be more impressive than they were before, but they're not going to be as impressive as you were hoping for. You were being lazy. So I'm looking to create... some character. I do believe that has character. Now, this is going to be really hard for me to mix because these headphones are great in the top end. They show a huge amount of information in the top end, far too much. Uh, but they're terrible for balance. So... In these headphones, that's the right volume. I'm confident that right now you can't hear it. In which case, I'm going to go up here somewhere. Actually, forgive me for a second. Yep, that's right. Back to the cans. 
See, so I'm learning my headphones. I don't love them, but I'm learning them. Oh, nice. So we've got contrasting sounds. There's some similarities in frequencies, but we've got contrasting sounds which together are building us something that we didn't have individually. Like this sound on its own. Nice brass, sorry, nice bell with uh, with a little bit of detail on the front, some chirpy, squawky, bleh, kind of stuff on the front to make it interesting. And a uh, bog standard kind of a um, of a pad sound. Put the pair together. We've now got something rather interesting. Normally I might go and finish the rest of my sound. We'll come back to that. The next stage is going to be effects. It's hard to have a loud sound without effects. Remember, as I said, a loud sound, a loud patch, is essentially a bus. So we took our drums and our bass and we whacked them into a rhythm bus. Just as we would take all the mix elements in our arrangement whack them into the master bus and then master it. Whack ozone all over it and pretend that we did something amazing. It's exactly the same. So we take the separate elements of our sound and we've got to bring them together and treat them as one sound. So I don't look at putting effects on every single one of these and then summing them up here. It can be done and it's not what I want. But Start learning by saying, I'll put all my effects on the bus here. So. What I feel from that is how these two sounds go together. At the moment, they're a bit too contrasty. I've got my high chime and my low pad, but it feels like there's a gap between them. Now, we've got one or two ways of attacking that. One way is to say, OK, I've got something missing and make my third sound that goes in the middle. Ooh. I'm going to do some of that by changing the first sound, because I've got plans for my third sound to do something else. It may not work out that way, but that's what I'm thinking. So, we've either got to lower that sound, There's, there's things about this that I kind of do like, but it's not really what I wanted to do. So I knew from the beginning that wasn't really going to be my outcome, but it was good to show you what happens if we try and pull the two together. Oh, the other option I could have, and I will show you this one as well, is... That does work. What we're hearing outside, I don't know, but it does work. So what we've done is we've pulled the filter down, therefore, seeing that was a bandpass filter, uh, to, to make sure we didn't have too much welly in it, uh, we've pulled that filter down so that it's a little closer to where our pads filter is sitting at. That I like better. So where I had a long attack here, I've now gotten rid of the attack so that that sound, the pad part of the sound, goes right. And it's brighter, nus, 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 
matches a little bit better with the very brightness of the chime. Happy again. So. So my chorus has added an extra something. It's made the whole thing richer overall. You can put effects in as you see fit. You can get into distortions and all manner of things, but I'm not going to go across that too much because we've covered that earlier in the process. But I'll go through bog standard sorts of things that, that traditionally people will do. Add it in. You may wonder why I'm using these little red things that people say are shit. Well, they're shit themselves because if you start saying an effect that actually does its job is shit, then you're probably shit thinking. These have a character, but they work quite nicely, especially if you learn to work the way they work. So we can do things like... You've got quite a bit of control over what we do. You can go with slow with the... Slow with a big modulation, or fast with a small modulation amount, and of course you can get back into feedback, which I'm not loving here. This is just meant to be a general chorus, and it's doing its job nicely. The delay doesn't have any modulation or anything, um, but by duplicating down the track, down the track, we're creating the sense of size, the sense of coherence with an atmosphere around it, and merely just that as our original sounds moving around like this and this one's moving around like this, suddenly they're interestifying each other. Me likey. Reverb. I've just taken a bit off the bottom end because the last thing you want to do is add, especially a complex pad where you've layered, the last thing you want to do is to create mud in the bottom end and your reverb will create a massive amount of mud in the bottom end on a lot of complex pads. So it's better to get rid of it in the first place. To simply say I don't need to reverbify everything that's happening in this sound back in the sub 100 hertz frequency range because that's where my bass lives. If you don't have a bass in your mix then your pad, your layered sound, which doesn't have to be a pad, it can't, you can layer to make leads, you can layer to make basses, you can layer to all kinds of things. It's just as easy as a way to show it. Besides I love these sounds, so if I'm going to do this for an hour I'm going to enjoy it. You can use that, but bear in mind, if you allow your um, reverb to get there, then it's still going to sound super muddy. Let your sound cut through, rather than making your sound huge purely with reverb. Let the reverb make it happen a little bit higher, it'll still sound good. End up with a cleaner bass that way. If you're unsure ever with reverb what you want your reverb to sound like, do what I just did. Guess what? I can now hear exactly what my reverb sounds like. Reverb is another layer, because it's just really a whole pile of delays. And in this case, it also gives us the ability to be adding some modulation as well. So it's really just a delay line and a chorus, which is a delay line too. I like when modulation amounts really high. It starts to give you a kind of almost white noisy thing on the end of it as it fades out. Nice. This is a real patty sound, so it's supposed to sit inside the mix and, and be behind. You've got your bass, which is, a, I'm assuming, relatively forward in your mix. 
the drums, which are probably also relatively forward in your mix. And hopefully you've got your leads and your melodic elements fairly forward in your mix. Your pads are a kind of melodic element, but let them sit back. Just as parts of... That sound are now forward and parts are backwards. We've actually got that ting, the chime part. Not comfy. We've actually pulled it back. And by adding these effects, especially the reverb, you'll hear how the front of that sound, that chime, is pretty forward, especially in these things. But once we add the reverb, by dealing with these two sounds as one sound, we've smooshed them together and the chime and the pad really come together and we're able to play it. Now, in a melodic fashion, because it's now become a different instrument from what we started out with. So there we've got similar in our two oscillators here. Ooh, two different. Here, but we found a way to glue them together. One is by making sure that the frequency of something is in common enough to pull them together. In this case, I altered one of, one of my sounds to make it so that they came together closer. Remember, the other option would have been to add a third sound in the middle. So I'll do that quite a bit where I'm uh, particularly making Europa sounds. I might say, OK, I know I've got three oscillator parts here. I'm going to make one sound that's down there. I'm going to make one sound that's up there. And then we're going to make a sound that glues them together. Let's go to making our third part of our sound. And we're going to chase a real direct all out physical movement here. No, not that kind of movement. Um, some scales and chords. I'm doing that because I want to create Chord. Actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I changed my mind. I'll leave it there, though, because I might decide to change my mind again. This I do want. It's too fast. created an arpeggio. Now we just got to decide where this is going to sit. I love brass. So I will start by saying, well, what if I make a brass sound? And there is going to be a certain amount of what if in this, because I need to find a sound that fits in the mix. I may have decided that early on, or I may not have. We are going to do some separate processing on this because this sounds great on its own, 
but how is it going to fit into the mix? Now let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, what I was looking for there, and bear in mind I'm working in cans, which I'm very uncomfortable to have a sense of whether I've got things right here. Um, I'm looking for something that adds a physical movement to the sound without overdoing it. So I'm absolutely not looking for an overdriven 909 to <laughs> all the way through this. I'm looking for something that, that adds movement once we've settled with the main. So the main part of the sand gets itself done and then this peers out of the murk, so to speak. If I were fussy, I might create another envelope that turns up the volume of that sound. But I'm not going to do that here because it's just complex and unnecessary. Um... Now what I'm doing is I'm looking to carve a space for that. So seeing the other instruments are there and are set, this is exactly what you do when you're mixing an arrangement. And you say, okay, well, what role does my flute have? And so you go through and you accentuate what's great about that flute sound. You don't accentuate the bits you like about the flute sound. You don't just go, oh, I really like the chiff, and accentuate the chiff, and then find that you've lost all the melodic elements of the flute, because you've then got a hi-hat. A weird hi-hat, but you've got a hi-hat. You emphasize the melodic parts in the story. Now, as part of that, the chiff may be playing super well, in which case you're going to go with it, and you may emphasize the chiff a little bit, because it's part of your story. But if you're just emphasizing it because you like chiffs, then maybe you should be writing Peruvian music rather than whatever it is you were writing. Um, so focus on the reason for the sound in the mix, and then you're going to accentuate the parts of the unique sound, so the flute in this case, that's helping it to lead the mix where it needs to. At the same time, we might say, on this sound here, let's get us another EQ. This is really mixing 101. Uh, same thing. This was 5.7 at 1670. So we find 1670 or something similar. And don't just go by the numbers. Because the numbers can and will lie to you every time. I can take that pad
and chop part of it out. I'm not hearing well enough in here as to whether I'm achieving anything of any any use there at all. It is wired upright, so we'll uh, we'll stay with that. Oh yeah, I am. We don't want to be too extreme. Seeing I've got an EQ, I want that to be a little bit more. Big in the belly. I'm not going to grab this and just go. Because while it sounds great, I'm probably making a mess. I'll deal with that later when we get into a mix situation. Doesn't mean you couldn't, shouldn't, but just I'll be careful. There, so just that tiny, tiny bit more, bit of cut. You're not looking to carve a great rift valley through the middle of one of your sands to allow the other to have, because that's not a mix anymore. You know? So. So now I've walked you through making a layered sound. We've started by layering frequencies. So we've combined some frequencies by making uh, several versions of the same thing, detuning them, making slight temple changes in them, any of that sort of stuff, which is something that we can look at doing. I probably didn't emphasize enough, but they're same. So now let's look at making them different. So we now got two completely different. So two different timbres, similar, put them together. So we've created that bigness there. That's that movement within the frequency domain. We've created a contrast with this fellow. because he's not like the pad. We've adjusted to make sure the two have a place where they meet, because if they don't meet, they're just two random people. We've made a meet. We've now added in a physical movement because we've got our arpeggiator, which is just taking the notes we're playing. And moving them around as well. So they, while they have a frequency component in the sense that they interact with the existing frequency, so there's there, that's, it's happening, but that's not our real focus there. We're looking to create a physical movement within that piece so that we can actually hold our notes longer. Without any of us getting quite so bored. We've looked at how we can make sure that just as in a um, in a conventional mix, we can look at emphasizing frequencies that we want to have come through from one of the elements of our sounds. Like this is one sound now. We don't think of this as being three sounds, it's one sound. We can look at emphasizing and de-emphasizing certain elements within our sound. And then we look to turn into one sound. Here's the thing actually we can, a lot of you may well look at asking about, and it's really no different, but I'll do it seeing I'm here. Uh, shift there, and then shift to drag. I'll do that. Turn off caps lock. Uh, shift down D. 
there. I'll just make my sure my wiring is still as I would hope it was. Yes, it looks like it is. What I'm doing here is really gelling them together, really making sure that they group. Now we can do that before any effects. We can do it after some of the effects. We can even do it after all of the effects. So I'll try and remember to do that later. What I'm doing there is really, officially I should start this way, threshold to right to as low as it'll go, to ratio as high as it'll go, attack and release to as low as they will go. Uh, if necessary, drive your input, you can turn that back up, so that you're getting a good lump out of that sound. Now what we're looking for is that point where we can really hear the attack because the sound has to be able to introduce itself well, otherwise it'll disappear in the mix. We still want this to announce itself, at least for the moment. We may decide later we don't want it to announce itself, in which case we would drop this feature, uh, or even possibly compress it this way. So. Find one. Compressor has a good amount of bite, all dependent on the sound. In cans at least, I feel like the sound has clarified a little bit. What that's done is it's pulled it together and especially the yeah, especially the arpeggiator, even though that's really being kind of bitten into, it's pulled it into one. It's making a lot of the attack portion of that sound. If we turn that off. Still the same. Now you can have that in other places, as I said. We can take that, put it through a chorus and delay. Mostly what we hear there is that the, uh, that the delay seems to have gotten louder because it's just and the delay therefore has less contrast um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing but if you compress after a delay then you're turning your volume of your delay up it's, it's a very simple way. but if you compress after a chorus it minimizes some of the movement that you get in terms of volume from the chorus. So it can be good. What happens if we compress after the reverb? Now, a lot of people say, geez, you'd never compress after a reverb. But what if I was going to add another reverb? That's really compressed that reverb in, so it's a little less obviously, hey, there's a great big reverb on this, it's just... It's more that that sound now has just got this great big well, sound cloud worm feel to it. Um, So by doing it this way, no right or wrong, just by putting it in a different place, we've now said all of those elements of the sound, all of the oscillators, 
the uh, the same, the different, the, the the physical movement that we've got, and then the layers that we've added through our processes, our, our choruses, our, our delay echoes, our reverb, are now into one object. <laughs> Whether you choose the compressor before or after in this case is entirely going to depend on the story of this mix. If we want the role of this sound in our arrangement, and therefore our mix, to be very organic and big and airy, then I would compress first. If we want to do what I'm hearing here, is squashed into a sausage, therefore giving us space around it to do other things, there's a bit more of an EDM feel, then this is a valid way of going because, as I said, we've squashed this into a sausage. Dynamically, it's far less than it was before. We've emphasized the beginning of it, and we've left ourselves space for other things to happen around it. The dreaded 909s, uh, some other sounds around it. <laughs> Because even though there is a lot of reverb there, the difference is when it's uncompressed, it feels spacious. That's what the reverb's designed to do. But when we ruin some of what the reverb's trying to do, we're actually saying this is the sound itself. So where you put your compression, even in a layered sound, will have quite a marked effect on how that meta sound, uh, that third magical sound that appears out of combining things, uh, what that meta sound is, is defined even by things like where you put your compressor in the chain. So... <laughs> That's a lot. Travis, I really hope that answers your question. I think I've covered it, but if there's something missing, ask me down below. If you or anybody else has other questions or things you want me to cover, ask them down below. And as you start to see, I can be pretty responsive on this kind of stuff. Uh, so, yep, I really hope that over this whole series uh, of articles, starting at, uh, at bass sounds and working through uh, through poly sounds, through lead sounds and pads, and now of course layering within a sound. Uh, I hope that you've learned a lot. There is a huge amount in here. I know these videos are long and I know they're quite talky, but remember I'm the thinking guy, so if you know why you're doing things and how to do things, you're going to find that once you work out how to apply this stuff, that you're way better than you were a little while before. How do I know this? Not because I'm arrogant. Yeah, I may be arrogant too, but whatever, that's your business. Um, not because I'm arrogant, but because this is a process I've gone through. I, um, I've traditionally been weak in theory. I'm still weak in theory. But I went to a, a, a teacher with a classical background, and I said to him, hey, Mr. Teacher Guy, um, I want to learn to get better at what I do. I don't want to get better at learning to play Mozart. There's a fucker who used too many notes anyway. Yay, Scully. Um, but I wanted to learn how to improve what I did. So I took him my pieces and he said, hey, you want to do this? Half the time he went off and he'd go, oh, well, where you've done this bit, you want to do that. <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yes, teacher. That would be great. If I had any fucking idea what you just did. But I noticed over a period of time, not only with him, but more after him, that suddenly I was a lot more confident in how to put my notes. The stuff before him, I'd be like, oh, I'll try it there, or I'll try it there, or I'll try it there. Oh, fuck it, I'll just give up. Leave it there which meant that I had some very interesting harmonies. Now, I'm definitely not a 
a uh, you know meat and veg kind of guy and saying here I've got a formula chord progression a one four three or whatever. I don't know. But when I'm working what I do have, suddenly it makes a lot more sense in what I can do constructively and under my control. So if I'm listening to something and thinking mm, notes, notes are a little too much on this wrong side of interest in, then I'm, it's easier for me to find them and know where they're supposed to go. So with all this thinking stuff, if you take it in and go over it, and the great thing is that uh, in this case it's on YouTube, you can come back and go over it. My lessons weren't on YouTube, I was sat there with for an hour over a few months, but I had to just try and absorb it, which is good in many ways because you've just got to try and take in what you can. Um, but you can come back and you can go over it again and you'll find that, that suddenly there will be this point where you go, I really feel like I know what I'm doing now. And while I'm still very happy with a lot of my older records, I can listen to them and go, wow, that was pretty cool. I'm even happier with my newer records, let's say um, Triumph and Tragedy, because that one was one where I was really working very hard to try and work on bigger musicality, more notes, more control over those notes, rather than just let's whack down a great big sound. Uh, and that was so much easier for me to do. I've actually got a little sideline project in the background at the moment where I'm taking some well-known TV themes and making variations on them. And there is no way I could have done that uh, some years ago. No way I could have done that. It's still not easy for me, but I can take what I've gotten from the original composition and I can go somewhere with it Whereas a few years ago, I would have not been able to understand any of the language that I'd been given by the original composer, let alone how to take it anywhere that was remotely related. So you'll find that by going through this thinking stuff, allowing it to absorb and practicing it, I have got massive amounts of gain for when Mr. Teachman said, Benedict, go home and work on, you know, Give me a variation on that. Give me four or five variations on that. And I would go. <laughs> Probably got all half those notes wrong. But just variations alone and practicing them, suddenly I was far more able to progress my pieces in a relevant manner rather than saying, or here, I've got these three random loops, I'm just going to try and glue them together and I hope you don't notice that they're unrelated. I was able to say, okay, I've got my core melody. And that could drive the second section. Could drive the bit in the middle. drive another section that could be the bit before the end we'll bring it all back to the see so sometimes it takes a little while don't walk out of these thinking oh now I know that I put every knob at 45 degrees on bitching no let the thinking seep in and suddenly you're going to go, I actually knew what I was doing there. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time. Don't forget you can ask questions here or track me down on Facebook or whatever. I'm here to help you become a better independent musician, a happier independent musician. Thank you.